Hi guys, it's Abby and Chris again. Um, I just sort of wanted to pick Chris's brain here and ask him a few questions about this Economic Lifeboat site. I want to know exactly what made you want to get into this site and start building something and what makes you think that we need something like this? Well, back this, this isn't meant to sound condescending, but back when I was your age and, and had started for a few years in the financial planning business, I got a rude awakening and people who have seen my presentation called Understanding the Game know that I got a wake up call early on with the market upheavals in the late 70s and early 1980s that forced me to try and get to the root of how our system works because in the context of being a financial advisor in those days or of today giving advice on investments and what the markets are doing and stuff like that it certainly behooves me to know how all this stuff works mm -hmm. Um, and so I did that and I learned an awful lot about the financial system and the Federal Reserve, the system that we have that is technically, by the Fed's own description, a fractional reserve banking system. And it's something that, that cannot go on forever. You know, you've heard about debt, right? Mm -hmm. We all try and avoid debt. You know how much the U.S. is in debt as a I, country officially? I Twenty, I Twenty-one that. trillion dollars and counting, okay? The amount of the national debt for every one of us alive today that breathes in this country is something like $170,000 or something like that. Wow. That's your share of the national debt. I don't know if you knew that or not. Did not. <laughs> no. And so here's the simplest way I found to explain it and at the same time make the point that this system won't go on forever and that we need to look for alternatives for the type of a system that we have. Okay. Uh, because a lot of times over the years countries have gone into hyperinflation or currency collapses because of too much debt and whatnot that will inevitably happen here mm -hmm. as well it may not be tomorrow might not be for a while but it will inevitably happen and here's why imagine Abby that you and three of your friends are sitting at a table all right and you're gonna play a card so there's four of you playing a game of cards mm -hmm. I'm the dealer I have a deck I'm not playing the game but I'm supplying the cards so I deal each of you five cards and I tell you that you can play within certain parameters these different kind of games. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the night, when I come back, you need to repay me. Not the five cards that I loaned you, but six, because I'm entitled to one extra card for my interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. The punchline is that if any one of you can't pay me back those six cards, then I get to take possession of your home. Now, we'll see if you folks have thought about this yet, but Abby, I would ask you, what's wrong with that picture that I painted? You always win. <laughs> but why do I always win? I gave you each five cards, but you each have to pay me back six. So I don't care how good a card player you are, at least one of you is not going to be able to pay me because there's not enough cards on the table. That is how money works. When money at its source begins as credit from banks, and that's our system today, Mm -hmm. That is why as time goes on, debt grows exponentially larger. Our ability to service it shrinks because you've just got this open-ended right. debt that keeps piling and piling and piling until it falls under its own weight. That's how other currencies and systems have collapsed. That's how ours will mm -hmm. collapse one of these days. Again, it won't be tomorrow, may not be next year, but it's going to happen. We've had different tastes of it along the way when we have market upheavals like in 2000, the stock market crashed, in 2008 the stock market crashed, everything else almost went with it. They had to print all kinds of money to buy a little bit more time, but we know where the end game is one day right. for this kind of system. And given that the people that run and control this system are not going to change it, you're not going to vote a, an honest money system into being by voting for the right people because none of them even know mm -hmm. care about this kind of thing but what do we do and that's where the concept of an economic life vote comes from is that we may or may not ever need to use it but it's nice to have a lifeboat handy where and I and I go back to the example of Y2K if you remember that back mm -hmm. in 1999 when a lot of people thought that everything was going to fall apart because the computer glitch was going to make everything you know stop working i think society would have benefited because people would have discovered their neighbors again uh we wouldn't all be like today of course we didn't have this much back then but everybody wouldn't just be on the internet and ignoring their wives and their husbands and their kids you know um i was on a trip recently and 
uh, I saw a, a, a couple with two children and all four of them are sitting in a beautiful setting, beautiful island, all four of them doing this here. Uh -huh. Okay. If we lost that technology, lost the money and so forth, we'd actually have to learn how to live again. That'd be kind of an <laughs> interesting situation to be in. So maybe we'll be forced into that someday, folks, and so it would behoove us all to know some of the things we need to do between now and then to get ourselves there. So that's the practical part of it, and the part of it that I think is a, um, a political statement in a way is that, and I've talked about this in other contexts, it's not the purpose of this, uh, 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 another introductory, I think, video that we have for the Lifeboat site, but the fact that the dollar system has become such a scourge in the world is something also that I think is, is motivating me personally mm -hmm. to call it out, to talk about the things where it's not only the American people who have been made debt slaves and you know unthinking consumers at times just to serve the system, but entire countries now are rebelling against it. You know, uh, I had the great privilege years ago of meeting the former congressman, Dr. Ron Paul. He was a great libertarian leader, still is. And um, he has his own website, uh, the Center for Peace and Prosperity. He has talked about a lot of what is wrong with the kind of monetary system we have today. Mostly, as you see here on this slide, Abby, he, he talks about how the dollar system and the kind of banking system that we have has enabled a lot of the foreign policy uh, things that we have done as a country and wars and so forth. Bankers always benefit from wars. I don't know if you knew this, but the same family literally were on opposite sides of World War II. You had the Warburgs in Germany financing Hitler and the Warburgs at the Federal Reserve financing the U.S. Uh, the bankers always win. There's no sides when it comes to the banking system. Even between Germany and the U.S., they always win. They always make more money and we, we die while they make money. You know, and I mentioned on another one of our introductory videos this whole idea of the 1% versus the 99%. It's very true. And a lot of people have started to understand that if we change the monetary system and we have a monetary system that is designed to benefit people, mm -hmm. then people will have a better life. I mean, it's no wonder that corporate profits have gone through the roof over the years while with all of what you hear on a TV about the unemployment rate is the lowest in 50 years. It just came out that we're recording this on October the 16th, just this morning. It came out that for the first time in history, there are over 7 million unfilled jobs in the U.S. Jobs are looking for people to fill them. Now, that's a whole other subject about why the, our education system has failed, so we don't have people that can fill those jobs and so forth. But even with those strong job statistics, wages still aren't going up very fast. And again, that's part of the priorities of money. It's part of the priorities when we have all been taught to worship the almighty dollar and what it supposedly stands for, and that is that you and I are treated as commodities. All right, folks, on my National Investor website, if you click on the commentary section, you'll see a, a biography I did years ago of the late George F. Johnson. Some of you out there are old enough to remember the Endicott Johnson Shoe Corporation. Once upon a time, corporate leaders treated their employees like people. Today, we're commodities. And that's why wages don't go up. It's because the dollar system, it, it actually is a negative to have wages go up. That's why a lot of people who they call themselves capitalists, they don't like minimum wage laws mm -hmm. because they want people to be treated as commodities, pay them as little as you can possibly do so the corporate profits are more. It's crazy. And that's one of the things that we talk about with the Lifeboat site is how do we come up with a different kind of a system? You know, a lot of you, and I had to throw this in here, not for any particular reason, but I always loved George Carlin. Um, you know, I may not have agreed with everything he said and was all about, but the guy was one of the more, I think, honest and accurate public commentators of any comedian that was a contemporary of mine. And I love what he says here, you know, trying to be happy by accumulating possessions is like trying to satisfy hunger by taping sandwiches all over your body. But that's true. And, you know, I get back, to Abby, to that card analogy that I used. Because as time goes on, when it becomes harder and harder for people to make ends meet, pay off their debts and service their debts, what's the answer that the system has? Borrow more money. Mm -hmm. 
okay, as a nation. Donald Trump's going to make America great again. How? We're going to go farther into debt. We're going we're to borrow our way to prosperity. Okay, that's how everything works. And you think about it, you go back three or four generations to people, and I'll finish this with, with the slide of old grandma, but um, it used to be that people lived frugal lives. You know, you only, you only bought what you could afford. The only thing maybe you borrowed money for was for a house. And now people borrow money for everything from groceries to pay their taxes or, or whatnot. And it's not because only our values changed, but the system that requires, and get this folks, the system that requires ever expanding credit owns the media and owns now the culture that makes you think that you can't get by without borrowing more money. You need one automobile for every member of your family over 16. You need two television sets for every member of your family over eight. Okay, you need a computer for everybody in your family, and you need to consume. We, you know, I could do a whole segment, we will one of these days, just on energy. And you and I talked about this one day about the fracking and all of the stuff, the, the, what's going on with our environment. That also is, is commanded by money to do that. That the money needs to generate more money. They shovel all this debt. One of my older videos that's still on my YouTube page here, I talk about exactly this. They shovel all the tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars into energy companies to create more energy, recover more energy than we really truly need. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the banking system over here got people to buy more cars, bigger houses, requires more heat, more cooling to, to make mm -hmm. that house comfortable. And, and this is all the, re the needs of money. You and I don't need all this stuff, but money needs us to need it. And that's the system that we have that's broken, that has led to consumerism and $21 trillion in counting national debt. And it's a system that a lot of people are trying to change. Because look, I, I've oftentimes in the past been at odds with the so-called greenies and tree huggers, environmentalists. Uh, sometimes I think that they don't understand the point, but there is one thing that I do believe is undeniable. Mm -hmm. And that is like this graphic that we just put up here if the corporations get their way, they're going to destroy the entire world in their quest just mm -hmm. to generate more dollars and more interest from debts and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. You know, I love this, this guy here, Bucky Filler, the late Bucky Fuller. Um, he was a visionary. You know, the, the guy was an inventor, like a friend of mine I live with. You know, th these are people that, that realize that you have to think outside the box, that, that there's nothing that is written in stone that says you have to do things the way Republicans or the Democrats want. That you have to do things the way, you have to eat the way Monsanto says you should eat. You have to consume the way the, all of the television commercials tell you to do it. And Bucky Fuller basically said something that, that is so absurdly simple. And that is that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Mm. All right. now. I learned a long time ago, or I, I, I came to the conclusion a long time ago, Abby, that this country and people's lives in this country are not going to be saved by who becomes the next president. Okay. You know, do we get rid of the hated Donald Trump and put some the Democrat in there or anything like that? The system is not going to change itself. And we as voters are in, to a great extent a part of that system. Yes, you can have some influence on the local level, but as we've talked about in some other videos on a national level, it's just a circus that we've all been sucked into. That we're, the, the house always wins. It's like going to Las Vegas, mm -hmm. folks. You go into the voting booth, you pull that slot machine, the house always wins. Mm -hmm. It is not set up for the house to ever lose. And that's why the system is not going to change itself. You're not going to change it through the ballot box. We need to take the initiative ourselves to build these different lifeboats, to have alternatives that people can latch on to. In a minute, I'm going to get to kind of a cause that you and I overlapped on here a while back, uh, that being the Venus Project and the late Jacques Fresco. We want to talk about him. But one of my heroes, folks, in life is a guy that I knew also from upstate New York originally. His name is Paul Glover. And back in the late 80s, this guy and some of his friends in Cayuga County, New York, it's the, the Ithaca is the county seat. It's a city on the south end of Cayuga Lake, beautiful Finger Lakes region. And a lot of people back then were worrying about 
Americans losing their jobs because you know the, the Walmarts replaced the local mom and pop and mercantile stores. And when the common denominator is always the dollar and you need as a company, an employer to you know, meet your economies of scale and to just lower all your costs, it also includes people. You can't fight that if you're using a dollar. So they came up with the idea, what if we had our own currency? And we have our own value system in our own community, we have our own currency. And they came up with what they called Ithaca hours. And the reason they denominated their local currency as an hour is because they figured when all is said and done, a man's time or a woman's time and talent is valuable. And, and it should their, their time, their hours, should be treated as a, an important commodity also. And they, they had great success in getting a lot of business people uh, in the area to latch onto this. It did not replace dollars in Ithaca, New York, but it was a foundation. It was a small lifeboat of a foundation. And what if Y2K had been everything it was cracked up to be? And the whole system, as we know it, had ceased to exist. These people and other communities that have done the same thing, hundreds of them all around the country that, that nobody knows about unless they live there. Uh, Berkshires, if you're from uh, Massachusetts, the Berkshire Mountains area, they have Berkshires. Same thing as this, many other places. Uh, you would at least have something controlled locally that would have survived that Y2K thing where people could have at least dealt in you know, clothing, food, and so forth, services, doctors, vets, whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, it was a start. And I love this kind of thing. I, I've always promoted this. You know, I, I'm going to put a couple of slides up here. Actually, Abby is. She's the one technically a student. I, I can't. Uh, I, can, I can turn a computer on. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to put a couple of things up there about Paul. And one of the things that he has done the guy's a visionary. He really is. He's, he's a great man. He right now, if you're in, if you live in Pennsylvania, and some of my conservative friends from years ago would be absolutely horrified to hear me say this, he is the Green Party candidate for governor in the state of Pennsylvania. Vote for him. Don't vote for Republican. Don't vote for the Democrat. Vote for Paul Glover, the Green Party candidate this year in Pennsylvania. He has come up with using the foundation of a local currency system. Now they have, he he's now lives in, in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Orchard Project. They come up with healthcare system alternatives mm -hmm. for people to share each other's burdens and to have a cooperative. Uh, he, he says that we need to replace the middle class with a mutual class, people who, who are mutually dependent on one another in their own local areas. I, I can't say enough about this guy. You need, you know, we're putting his, uh, website up here and some of his work, you need to look this guy up. And even if you don't live in Pennsylvania, you need to look at this for your own community. You know, one of the things he's done also, Abby, is to uh, t take a lot of blighted areas in the inner cities, and again, with the Philadelphia Orchard Project. He's not the only one doing that. In Detroit, uh, there's an urban farm that they're in the process mm -hmm. of building. I've known of some people when I lived in around, around the Chicago area a couple of uh, retired NFL players that have found some old factory. They're making an aquaponic operation out of it. They're hiring inner city youth, getting them off the streets, getting them gainfully employed, teaching them where food really comes from. You know, a gallon of milk and a, and a head of lettuce doesn't come from the grocery store shelf. It didn't just materialize overnight, you know, while they slept. And it's, it's great stuff. It's people helping people. This again, folks, is part of an economic lifeboat in your area. You know, support your local farmer's market, support your local mom and pop stores, and, and get some energy around you. Maybe it's part of your church family, maybe it's a civic organization you're a part of. You know, find alternatives to the system that we have. If you believe as we do, that we shouldn't have only unhealthy, genetically modified, cheap food as our alternative. If you believe that we should be able to do business with one another and not support our, quote, leaders destabilizing foreign countries or whatever. Let's start to take a little piece of our commerce at a time away from that top-down system and do it in a way that positively supports our friends and families in our local communities. You know, there are all kinds of models that people have come up with. Some of them are based on community currency. Some of them are based on network bartering, all different kinds of things like that. Here's one, you know, idea of the solidarity economy. It makes the point, again, of, you know, before we had 
nations. Mm -hmm. We had people that lived locally in clans, you know, or tribes, or whatever the case may be. You know, a handful of families that joined together to help one another. This guy was better at growing this, this guy was a better hunter, this one did this, this one did that. And as time went on and populations got bigger and things got a little bit more complex, you went up the ladder as far as the kind of government the government that you had and the kind of protection you had for that. And now the creator uh, of government, people, we turned this into a Frankenstein monster. And this top-down system, this Frankenstein monster has gotten out of hand. We need to go back to kind of square one as best as we can and start over again. You know, a lot of people have looked at, for example, Bitcoin mm -hmm. as this would be a bigger, more universal means of an alternative currency. Bitcoin has got its own problems uh, logistically, I think, as far as being an alternative. But hey, they're on, they're on the right track, at least those people that looked at Bitcoin uh, as a monetary alternative. It's not workable as that for a lot of different reasons, but it's on the right track. And uh, I, I think we're going to see in so many ways, and this is exciting, and this is why folks with what we're doing with building an economic lifeboat, we're, we're, we didn't start this. There is already a large number of people that are starting to wake up to the fact that we need in many ways to break free from this top-down structure mm -hmm. and to do it positively, to do it in a way that's solution-oriented. Um, folks, I gotta tell you that when Abby and I first met her. Her mom introduced the two of us. And you got to meet my daughter. She, she, all this stuff you talk about, Abby, boy, you, you, you can't believe how much she knows and how much she keeps track of. I was floored. Well, first your mother knew who uh, an old acquaintance of mine, Frank Schaefer, was. We were talking about religion one day. And I never met anybody who knew what Frank, who knew Frank Schaefer. Uh, in the same way, that's a whole other different, yet another different subject, folks. Um, and likewise, when I was talking with you and your mom over dinner that one night, you knew who Jacques Fresco, the late Jacques Fresco now, sadly was, uh, and his Venus Project. It's actually right here in Florida, folks, in Southern Florida. And uh, you know, give us your quick impression of him, Abby. I, I love the fact that he likes a resource-based economy because like you were saying, everyone is all hail the dollar and everyone is, you know, it's from the top down and they sort of control everything. So I like the fact that it would be a way for a community itself to use its resources as you know trading and goods and things like that and rather have this big government say this is what you have to do it's a lot better to have the smaller communities that rely on each other and rely on the ecosystem and the resources that they have in order to trade and you know make things happen like that you know and we're going to put a couple of slides up here we'll give you their website the venus project i re regret that i never got to meet Mr. Fresco personally before he passed away, but I am planning a visit in the very near future down to the Venus Project. It's in South Central Florida. And there's a lot of there's a lot of other people who are doing some of the same kind of things, but he was truly a visionary. And you can look him up on YouTube. There's a lot of old videos. And one really old one, I don't know if you ever saw this one, Abby, but he was interviewed, uh, it looked like it was 40 years or, or so ago, by Larry King one night. You know, and there are things too, in the news that people don't realize reveal just how many people are waking up. And of course, as the editor of the National Investor talking about the markets and economy and currencies and so forth, I've been all over, among other things, the story of Europe and its slow disintegration really from when they came out with a common currency in 1999 to now they're having to move heaven and earth to keep everybody on board and keep that currency together. And again, the euro as a currency was sold to the people of Europe as something that would benefit them. A lie, which governments often tell, and especially when bankers run governments, because the euro was intended to consolidate and strengthen the power of banking and corporate control of the people of Europe. More and more people are wising up to that. Greece is effectively a bankrupt country. They're population has been subjugated by the economic priorities of the people who run the European Union and European Central Bank, none of whom live in Greece or really give a rat's rear end about Greece. And what has that led to? It's a more acute problem for people than what we have in the U.S. And so what has happened is that the people in Greece, and you don't hear this also on the news, 
they have come up. I talked about Paul Glover. Everywhere in Greece, every little local community, you've got your own currency. You've got your own local bartering system. You've got people who have built an economy within an economy in Greece because they have had no choice because if they they stay with this whole euro system they're just a nation of serfs living by subsistence and while they continue to pay interest to banks in that aren't even in Greece uh, Italy is the next one where this is in the process of happening that's in the news right now and so all over the world you've got a rebellion against centralized banking the power that it exercises over every single aspect of our lives and our health and what we're told we can eat, what we can believe, what we can do. And uh, it, it's, you know, we want to be part of the revolution. I guess it's the easiest way to put it, but it's a positive one. It's one that's based on solutions and it's, it's based on getting away from that. You know, years ago, when people in this country lived through the Great Depression, most everybody was fine because they were not as dependent on this overall system as we see today. And so our job, Abby and mine, and those who are gonna be joining with us in this effort, people that we'll never meet uh, in different parts of America and different parts of the world, like in Greece, all of us are trying to do the same thing, to get us weaned from this top-down banking and corporate controlled Frankenstein monster that people, we didn't plan on this, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't think this is what government was gonna end up being and the people that run the government. But we want to get everybody off of that one piece at a time, one part of our life at a time, and find solutions. In this brief video, we've talked about a few of those solutions. You're going to re read and learn about many, many more in the months and years to come. So again, check out our website, economiclifeboat.org. Sign up for our free mailing list, where from time to time, if there's something that we think is interesting, uh, that that comes uh, that meets these different objectives we're talking about. We'll send that to you, and we'd ask you to support us as well in these efforts. Thank you for tuning in.